We're glad you're here today. Come on, y'all stand and let's sing together about how good God is. You believe that today? There's nothing better than Jesus. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, sing it this morning. Oh, there's nothing. That's right.
He's good, amen? amen? No matter what we could go through, no matter where we are in life, the enemy would tell us that it's bad. But God is good. And we believe that together this morning.
are so, so good. God, you're worthy of all of our praise. Sing who else we cry. Who else are all try out to worship? His glory taught the stars to shine. God's creation longs to have.
I'm reminded this morning of Psalm 34, verse 8, that says, To taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one that takes refuge in Him. The goodness of our God is not dependent upon our circumstances, just simply who He is. And so I don't know where you are today, but can we rest and trust to know that we have a God that is good? And we have a God that needs to, all the honor and all the praise that we can give him. And that's why we're here this morning is to praise and honor our good and great and mighty God. And may that just drive us through our time of worship today and drive us through our lives to honor him as we serve him and use our lives for his glory. We're so thankful you're here today. If you'll take a seat for just a moment this morning, we're so excited for what the Lord is doing here at our church. If you'll take a minute, look to somebody to your left or right and just say good morning. Say welcome, so glad to see you. We hope that you've already felt welcome here at Ridgecrest, but we do want to say uh, welcome to you again. And we're so excited that you're here with us in the room or if you're worshiping with us online this morning. If you're a guest of ours, we want to say a special welcome to you. We're so thankful to have you and we would love to know who you are. Here at Ridgecrest, we say all the time that God is calling us to reach people, build them up and connect them to the mission and purpose of God. And so we'd love to help you know more about that mission that God has given us as a church and also know more about our church in general so that you can get plugged in to that. So if you are a guest, let us know who you are by doing a couple things. The first thing you can do is fill out the connection card. It's on the back of your worship folder that you received on your way in. If you'll take that card, tear it out, fill out the information, and you can drop that card in the baskets as you leave the service. But we would rather you bring that card to our Welcome Center. And the Welcome Center is out the back door here to the right, side door here to the left. And we'd love to meet you face to face, get to know you, put a name with a face, and be able to just remember who you are and talk more about our church. And so again, yes, we'd love for you to come by the Welcome Center as you exit the building today after our service. Also, though, you can fill out our connection card by scanning the QR code that you'll see in the seat rack in front of you. Or if you're worshiping online with us, you'll see that QR code on your screen at this time. And as you scan that QR code with your smartphone, it'll take you to a form. And once you see that form, you'll be able to fill out some information. Let us know what areas that you're interested in in our church and then hit submit. And then once you hit submit, it comes to us and we'll follow up with you um, this coming week with more details. I had a conversation uh, with a lady this past week that submitted a form this past Sunday. And it was just a joy to talk to her and help her know more about our church. And it just really, really uh, blessed me to have that conversation with her. And she was excited about what the Lord was doing in our church and how she could get plugged in. So again, that's just another way to reach out to us in the days ahead. A couple things before um, we continue in our time of worship um, this morning. The first is this, just a reminder, you'll see in your worship folder um, a little insert there about Vacation Bible School. Just want to make note of that again, just praising the Lord for some numbers and the different things that he did a couple weeks ago at Vacation Bible School. As a reminder, those numbers represent a child or represent a soul and someone that the Lord worked in a special way. And so again, thank you for being faithful um, and just being a church that gives and supports um, in Vacation Bible School. A couple other things, just a reminder, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, our Ridgecrest Academy Discipleship and Man Church will meet at 5 this afternoon, so I'd love for you to be a part of that. And then one last thing um, is we have our prayer cards uh, for the month of June, and you see them here. Um, the prayer, the the area that we're praying for is actually Utah um, during this time frame. And we're excited because we have a team leaving this week, going to Utah as well to serve with Awaken City Church. And that's where Jonathan and Jennifer Blair are and they're serving currently. And so a team of ours from Ridgecrest will leave this week. So as you get one of these cards today, be mindful this week to be praying for that team. But also you can see on the back of this card some specific things that we can be praying more for the church and for Jonathan and Jennifer. So we'd love for you to pick up one of these Utah prayer cards, put it somewhere that you can be reminded to pray uh, specifically for what the Lord is doing in that area of our country and specifically in those that we love so much of Jonathan and Jennifer. And so pick one of those up on your way out today. I want to pray for us. And then after that, we'll turn our attentions to the screen and then we'll hear from our pastor um, and from God's words. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. What a blessing it is to be together Uh, on this special day and just to celebrate uh, Father's Day and we just praise you for that and just first and foremost stop in the midst 
of recognizing your goodness uh, to us and how you are a perfect heavenly father. And God, we have what we have because of who you are and what you've done for us and your love and, and the life and the hope that we have because of what you've done ultimately through your son, Jesus. And so God, we praise you for that. God, we do pray together though today just uh, for our time as we study your word in just a few moments. I pray right now that you would anoint our pastor, that you would speak clearly through you, uh, hit your word through him. So God, use our pastor today greatly to proclaim the goodness of your word and the gospel and how lives can be changed for eternity's sake if we would just turn and surrender and look to you and follow you. And so God, use him greatly today and speak to us. God, speak to us today through your word. Thank you, Father, for our church and the blessing it is just to meet together. May we never take this for granted. And God, would you continue to burn in our hearts a passion to make a difference for your kingdom. And specifically, as we think of just Utah and just mentioning that together and Jonathan and Jennifer, God, and the Waken City Church, God, I pray right now that you would work mightily through their church. God, that your Holy Spirit would just uh, anoint the leadership and and, and bring conversations and open doors that need to be had for the future for them to continue in that area of our country to take the goodness of the gospel to those that desperately need it. Father, we pray specifically for Jonathan today and his health. God, just praising you for where he is, but God, also praying today that you would continue to touch his body and heal him and protect him and use him mightily to continue to lead for your glory there as well. We pray for our team that you would use them this week to, to love and to encourage those in that area. And I pray that you would change those that are on our team as well. God, speak into their lives and work in their lives this week as they go and serve. Thank you, though, again, though, Father, for today and our time to worship you. And we do desire more than anything to hear from you and ask that you would help us to do what it is you're calling us to. God, we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and open up to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me tell you how to find that real fast. 2 Peter comes right after 1 Peter. Uh, let me do a couple of things while you're, uh, while you're uh, finding your place there. Uh, number one, it's good to be back. We were at Southern Baptist Convention this past week, and if you want to hear any uh, reports on that, I'm going to talk a little bit about that before my Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, and uh, but we we worshipped with you while we were traveling. Um, we listened uh, in in the car, and um, and enjoyed the message. Appreciate Chuck and the message that he brought uh, to us uh, uh, last week, and uh, so appreciate that. Uh, it, so we worshipped in the car. You some of you do that uh, when you're traveling down the road, I assume. Um, by the way, I was enjoying our worship this morning. I, yeah, I don't know if you could see, uh, Bree Lewis was doing our drums. I don't know if y'all could see Bree in there. And I've seen her play the drums. She's good. Uh, play the drums in the aquarium. I call that thing the aquarium <laughs> there. Uh, but she was in there. And she's not just playing, she's worshiping. And it's so cool. I was watching her worship while she played the drums. And Bree, I don't know where you are, but man, it just blessed me. Where, where are you, Bree? That, it blessed me watching you worship in there. She, she did a good job uh, uh, on the drum. But I don't know if you can see that, but from where I am, I could kind of see her. And I leaned over to Chuck, and I said, I said, she's not just playing the drum, she's worshiping. And so that's pretty cool. And that's true of our whole team up there, I know. But, uh, and by the way, next Sunday morning, we're going to do something. We, do, um, we try to do the Lord's Supper about once a quarter. Sometimes we'll do it more. Uh, uh, but um, because we're such a large congregation, Sunday mornings are a little bit more logistically challenging. 
But we're doing Lord's Supper next Sunday morning. I'll be bringing a message. By the way, a message the Lord gave me called Living in Babylon 2.0. And I'll share that with you. I hope you'll be here for that. But Lord's Supper next Sunday. Uh, and so uh, I hope you'll join us. But today, of course, we're here. It's Father's Day. And I want to take a moment before I share uh, God's Word with you and just uh, uh, say thanks to uh, our, our fathers. And we've done something that I don't know. Maybe we did this before. I don't think. You know, we always tease on Mother's Day, you know, moms get a gift and they, you know, and we, all that kind of stuff. And, and with the dads, we just don't do anything. Just say, thanks for being a dad uh, kind of thing. But maybe we're breaking out of our rut. We actually have a gift for men today, and uh, it's called One Minute Insights for Men, and we chose something that men would actually be able to read. It's a coloring book, and uh, so, uh, but guys, I picked that up, all of our guys, not just our fathers, but all of our guys. Uh, it's a pretty cool little devotional book, and we've got that available for you as you uh, leave uh, the building today, but I want to take a moment, and then we'll have prayer, but uh, if you're a father, I want to ask all of our fathers to stand for a moment and then remain standing, um, and uh, let's say thank you to our, our, all of our, our dads in here. And, and uh, you, you know, men, I just challenge you, a lot of folks don't know that a lot of these men are involved in a thing we call uh, man church, and it's... Uh, just reminding men of the role and responsibility God has given to them. And I believe more than ever before, uh, dads, uh, the importance of that in the culture that we are living in. We're going to need dads making investments. I'm so grateful for my son-in-law. I've already talked to him this morning. But I'm so grateful for his heart to invest in his children, my grandsons, uh, and uh, to invest the right stuff. I told you a couple weeks ago something he told me. He and I were out and about how he wanted to invest what God wants in them. And I'm so proud of that. That is our responsibility for all of us and men, and not just fathers, but fathers in particular. And so uh, if you have the opportunity to tell your father thank you today, make sure you do. Uh, I, I did this morning what I do every year. I tell you this every year. I don't know how it works up in heaven but I, I asked the Lord, would you go tell my dad thank you? Uh, my mom and dad are in heaven. And so on Mother's Day and on Father's Day, I just say, Lord, if, if, if it works, so would, you tell, would you tell my dad thank you for his investment uh, in my life? And if, they're, if your father's alive and you have a relationship there, then make sure you tell them. Some of you would say, I never really had a, a dad. I, I get that. And, and I understand that there can be pain in a in a setting where you say, I don't really have a father or a father I look up to. Well, here's what I would say to you. Always remember, and this is not an embellishment. The Bible says that God is a father to the fatherless. Never forget that you do have a father, and he, he is a perfect father. We live in a world of imperfection, but he is a perfect father. And today, if your heart is heavy because you didn't have or you had a dysfunctional family or father, that sort of thing, Turn your eyes on your heavenly Father. Nobody loves you like he does. I'm going to ask the entire congregation, would you stand now with us? And I want to pray, uh, and let's say a prayer of thanksgiving uh, for uh, our fathers. Lord, we do thank you for our fathers. We thank you for um, those who have made uh, such positive investments in our life. And uh, Lord, uh, for those who feel the sting of not having a father on a day like this, we pray that you will remind them that you are their father, that you love them deeply, and, and, and more so than any earthly father ever could love them. And Lord, I pray that today we'll have the opportunity to bless and encourage and celebrate our fathers. Let them know how much we love them. And for those who have gone on, as I've said, Lord, if, if, if it works this way, and I don't know, but you go tell them for us, thank you for loving us. Uh, for taking care of us, for investing uh, in us. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for and help our men, not just fathers, but all of our men, to rise up and be strong men of God in a culture that so desperately needs it. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you can be seated. <clears throat>
So uh, pick up your books on uh, uh, the way out, guys, if you will. Now today I want to talk with you on what I've called living between here and eternity. Let me ask you a question to get started this morning. How would you define a successful life? Now, you don't have to answer out loud, but if you thought about that and somebody asked you and you had to put that down, how would you define a successful life? Uh, I don't know what your answers might be, but several years ago, uh, there was a study conducted by Success Magazine, and it uncovered some surprising insights about how Americans view and define success. And I think that's important because, uh, because your definition of what a successful life um, is will probably affect greatly your habits, your values, your convictions, the decisions you make, and your behavior. That's how important our definitions really are about, about success and about the things that matter. And in this survey, they asked these Americans how to define success. And one of the questions was, how do you define success in business? What does that mean? 60% of the respondents said it means adding value to the lives of others. That's pretty good. And 20% uh, said success meant making a lot of money. They asked another question in that survey, and the other question was, what do you think is the single most important element for success? And I think that's an even more intriguing question. And the respondents uh, answered this way. 41% of those said, I believe that faith is the most important element in being uh, a success. 25% uh, said family. 11%, almost 12% said a balanced life, and 7% said uh, happiness was uh, the single most important element for success. Rico Tice, in his book, Faithful Leaders and the Things That Matter Most, he wrote this. Listen, he said, I'll never forget the funeral at which an old lady said to me, Rico, do you know what failure is? He said, no, ma'am, tell me. And what he said, what she said next has stuck with me ever since. This is what she said. She said, failure is being successful at the things that don't matter. Do you get that? Failure is being successful at the things that don't matter. And he goes on to say, success is hearing well done uh, uh, from the only lips that do matter. Success this is what she told him, is hearing well done from the only lips that that really matter. Failure is being successful at the things that don't truly matter at all. Well, the fact is, you can be successful a lot of things in life that don't matter for eternity. And when it comes to success, eternity, I, I firmly believe, needs to shape everything we do and how we live our life between here and eternity. So, in other words, an eternal perspective should affect everything about what we do. No matter what our vocations are, no matter what our goals are, our ambitions, eternity should factor in. Why? Because, as we'll see in a moment in our text, these things, this world is not going to make it. And so the things that last forever should be a factor in how we live between here and eternity. That's what I want to talk with you about this morning. If you're physically able to do so, why don't you stand with me? I know your outline says that we're going to begin in verse uh, uh, 11, but I want us to back up uh, to verse 9, if you will, okay? Look at verse 9 with me in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should uh, reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening uh, waiting for and hastening the coming of, uh, of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, Father, again, speak to our hearts from your word. Lord, uh, help us to understand how to have an eternal perspective on the life that we live, how no matter what we do, no matter what our goals and ambitions are, Help them be seasoned by 
eternity. So would you speak to us, prevent the enemy from distracting our hearts or minds uh, as we look at your word, and, and Father, help us not be, uh, Father, uh, distracted or the truth distorted in any way so that we can live with eternity in mind. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now let me give you a little context. Context is important anytime you're looking at God's Word. You need to understand the context in which it is presented to you. And really the context of the verses, the primary verses we read, verses 9 and following, uh, begin at verse 1 of uh, chapter 3. And uh, here's what's going on. Peter is writing to people that are getting beat up by the world. The culture is dark. Um, People are um, doing their own kind of thing. They're hostile to the gospel. They're hostile to the church. And they're, they're, they're harassing the people of God. They're telling them that their faith is not valid, that it doesn't matter. They're undermining what Jesus said, that he was going to return. And so this is kind of how they're being treated. It's a lot like the culture you and I are living in today, isn't it? And so Peter writes with a couple of purposes in mind. Number one, he writes to reassure and to encourage these believers. He writes to reassure them that what God said is true. And so that's why we picked up in verse 9, because they were saying, well, where's the evidence of his coming? He said he was going to return. You've been teaching us and you've been preaching that Jesus is going to return, but there's no evidence that he's going to return. Where is the evidence of that? And so uh, Peter says, these scoffers will come in the last days. This is a kind of argument they will make. There's no evidence to support that. Your faith is invalid because you've been saying this and it's not happening. So Peter writes to say, listen, just hold on, wait. Be patient, because what God has said, God is going to do. So he, Jesus said he's going to return. He's going to return. So, that's, so he's writing to encourage them because they're getting discouraged. They're getting beat up uh, by the world and the opinions of the world and the culture and the attacks on the gospel and all of that kind of stuff. So he writes to say, be encouraged. Don't give up. What Jesus has said is true. And the second thing he writes, the second reason he writes the verses that we read is to say to them, and now because that's in tr- that is true, I want to encourage you to live properly between here and eternity. That's why I said, so seeing that all of these things are going to happen, what God said were going to happen, eventually judgment, return of Christ, then judgment and wrath and all of that he's talking about. Seeing all of this is coming, he said, then what sort of people should you be? Well, it's a good question, right? We feel a lot like we're in the same kind of culture, I think, that they were in today. So what kind of people should we be between here and eternity? If it was certainly uh, the, uh, if it was, uh, 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 important for them to understand that then, how much more so because how much closer are we to the return of Christ? And so that's the, that's the question he posed. So what kind of people should you be? It's really a rhetorical question because he's going to tell them what kind of people that they should be. Now, I don't know if it's ever occurred to you or not, but the world you're living in is on life support. This world is on life support. It's going to pass away. And there's going to come a day when Jesus is going to return and he's going to pull the plug. Now, we can have, we can have rally. I mean, our culture can rally. There can be revivals and pockets of movement of God and all of that sort of stuff. And th- that's true. But in the end, he's already told us what exists now is going to pass away. In fact, he says there's only one thing that lasts forever. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of our God stands forever. What he said is going to last. That's why we have to take it very seriously. So what has he said? And how has he told us to live between here and eternity? Well, I want to show you three things that he tells them to encourage them in the midst of this kind of darkness that they were living in. First of all, he says that they, they and we must be a people of holy character. We are to be people of holy character. Look at verse 11. He says, uh, now, so what sort of people ought you to be? In life, here it is, of uh, of holiness and godliness. Now, he gave us some rather dramatic statements in verse 10 and then verse 12. If you look again, it says, But the day of the Lord 
That's the day of his wrath. That's the day of his return. It will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up, dissolved, and the earth and the works that are, on, uh, are, are done on it will be exposed. And then we're waiting for the, in verse 12, the hastening and coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. What's he, that's pretty dramatic stuff, right? And so what is he telling He says, because that is true, in other words, because eternity is coming and all the things here that are, are, are earthly, so to speak, are temporal, these things are going away uh, and these things will no longer matter. And so he says, we ought to be people of holy character until that happens. Now, what is holy character about? Well, I think there are at least three things that, that reveal kind of holy character in our life. First of all, it's our attitude. Holy character is, is revealed in our attitudes. And the Bible gives us an understanding of the kind of attitude that should characterize us. What kind of holy attitude? Well, it's the same one that characterized Christ. Paul writes about it in Philippians 2 in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2 and verse 5 when he says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Holy, holy character is an attitude of selflessness. And that's particularly important. Jesus was the model for that, selfless living, because we live in a selfish age, don't we? Where everybody's looking out for themselves. Everybody's about number one. And in the midst of that, Jesus came into the world and said, I want to show you a different way. And that different way was an attitude of selflessness. In fact, in that passage in Philippians, when Paul's talking about that, Paul says this, that Jesus thought it wasn't robbery to leave the throne of God and take on human flesh, become like one of the constituency. In other words, he's a king on his throne, and he has a selfless attitude, and he says, I'll leave here, I'll go down there, I'll become like them so they can come to know God the Father. And so it's an attitude of selfless. If anybody had a right to say, what? I'm not going down there. I'm not leaving this ultimate heavenly uh, throne and go down to people that don't like me anyway. You know, uh, he came into his own and his own received him not, the Bible says. But he didn't do that. He, he made himself a servant, the Bible says. So he left his throne. A, a holy attitude is reflected in selflessness. Selflessness. It's not about me. Holy character is not focused on us. It is submitted to a, the higher purpose of God. A, a, an attitude, a holy attitude of selflessness essentially says this. It's not, it's not what's important to me. It's what's important to God. What is important to God? So, so holy character is reflected in our attitude. Holy character is reflected by our activity too. Holy character lives consistent with God's Word. If you were to go back one letter, 1 Peter, in chapter 2, verse 11, Peter writes in his, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Now, listen, let me just stop right there. He called us, Peter called us sojourners and exiles. What does he mean by that? He means people that are passing through. We're on this journey. We're in this race, by the way. I'll talk about it a little bit later on. But we're in this race. And he, Peter calls us sojourners and exiles. It, why, is, why are we exiles? You know why we're exiles? Because when you became a follower of Christ, if you are, the Bible says you were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so guess what? You are now an exile. You're actually an enemy of the kingdom of darkness now. And so... Peter calls us exiles. This is not our citizenship, Paul writes about, is in heaven, the scripture says. So we are here, we are sojourners, we are traveling through, but this is not our home. Our citizenship is now in heaven. And, and so he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to listen to this, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. This battle, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? The battle. You fight your flesh, don't you? You fight your flesh every day, every week. Your flesh wants to, be, to do that which is just the opposite of what God wants. Why? Because the enemy of your soul wants to destroy your ability 
uh, to make a difference for the kingdom of God. There's this war that's going on. The Bible talks about you're in a war. You're engaged in this battle. It is a daily battle. And by the way, it will not go away until we finally, until this age is consumed and we finally end up with him in the kingdom of God. And so in, between here and eternity, our activity, our behavior is a reflection of our character. So our, is, our, is it holy character? Well, then our behavior will represent a, a holy activity. Holy character lets the Word of God order our behavior. It lets the word, uh, word of God set the agenda for our life to determine our path. You know, the Bible says this, Your word I have hid in my heart, what class, that I might not sin against you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, it orders our activity. By the way, look, that's why you ought to, you ought to master this book. And, and by the way, you ought to be mastered by this book. Because your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's why you, get, you, you, you are to spend time in the word of God because it will direct your path. It will, it will direct your behavior. It will keep you on a pathway of obedience. And then, third, holy character is reflected in our affirmations. All right? So it's reflected in our attitude of selflessness. It's reflected in our, uh, our activity obedience to what God has said, and then it is reflected in the things that we affirm. Holy character speaks to our convictions and values. Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 7, he said, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. You know, holy character is, is revealed by the words you speak and the reactions you express. Godly living is not a show. It's not a show you put on. Godly living should show, however, what we stand for. And by the way, godly living should also show what we stand against at times. A holy, a holy life, a godly life doesn't just happen because you, you became or you are a Christian. Holy living, a godly life, is something that you pursue because you're a Christian. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 14 said, Pursue, pursue holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. This is a pursuit. It is, it is we, we, we are to chase uh, God. Uh, and it, here's the reason it has to be pursued and it has to be practiced. Uh, D.A. Carson uh, wrote and put it this way. He said, because people do not drift toward holiness. You ever thought about that? You don't drift toward holiness, do you? Uh, excuse me, I'm just kind of, I'm, oh, I'm drifting toward holiness. I, I'm, I'm drifting toward prayer. I, I'm, 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 drifted, I'm drifting closer to God. You know what? Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness. They don't gravitate toward prayer uh, or obedience to Scripture and faith and delighting in the Lord. You know what we do? I've said this a hundred times over the year. Nobody has to tell me how to do the wrong thing. I don't have a coach to, uh, that has to tell me. I'm going to hire, you know, life coaches have become a real trendy thing in the past uh, five, six years. I don't have to hire a life coach to say, would you teach me how to do the wrong stuff? Man, I got it. And you do too, don't you? I don't drift toward godliness. I drift, but I drift the wrong way, don't we? I, I mean, that's our natural broken uh, uh, flesh, and that's the way we tend to drift. As he put it, uh, uh, he said, we drift toward compromise, and then we call it tolerance. Uh, we drift toward disobedience, and we call it freedom. We drift toward superstition, we call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control, and we call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness, and delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism. We slide toward godlessness, and then we convince ourselves we've been liber liberated. Right? So we don't, we don't drift. It is a pursuit. Uh, uh, a godly living is a per pursuit. But having said that, let me say this to you. A life of holy character in an unholy culture is not an easy task. The pursuit of it is just not an easy task. It takes courage. 
And holy living has always required courage because godliness exposes the darkness. Now, you're living in a dark culture, aren't you? It was dark when Peter wrote this. There's always been a, 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 a darkness because this world is controlled by the prince and power of darkness. And that's what makes living a holy, godly life difficult. And that's why it takes courage because when you live for God, you're going to expose the deeds of darkness. Jesus said it this way in John 3, 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And you see, when you live a godly life, you shine the light of God upon wickedness. And you say, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to. It happens. If you bring Look, you could cut all the lights off in here. You could black out the, the, the windows and, uh, and, and in the back. And it, it's pretty dark in here. But you could bring the, the smallest candle in here. And guess what? Everybody in the room could see it. You know why? Because light exposes the darkness. And Jesus said to us and, uh, that, that you are to be lights in the world exposing. The, when you live a godly life, guess what you're doing? You're acting as that candle. You're exposing, and that's why it's becoming more and more difficult to stand up for God in a dark culture because the darkness wants to put the light out because men don't come to the light because, as Jesus said, it exposes their deeds of wickedness. And so I I, I just tell you, consistent with Scripture, that, that when you live a godly life or you attempt to live for God, You're going to expose darkness, and that's not an easy thing to do in an unholy culture. It takes courage. And I believe this. I believe there's going to a day is coming when when the requirement for Christian courage is going to be greater than it's ever been in our lifetime. So, given the fact that Jesus is coming back, we must live with holy character. Number two, second, we must be people of hastening conduct. Hastening conduct. Look at verse 12 there. He says, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So what is hastening about? How, what does is, what is all that, that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Hastening is about living with urgency. It's about living a life of urgency. Now, the time of it says hastening the return of Christ. It doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we can speed his return up. The time of his return is already fixed. The Bible says he has appointed a day. That, that, that time is already fixed. So, so what, what does it mean for us uh, to live lives of, of hastening conduct? Urgent. It means urgency. We don't know exactly when this day is. But we must, we must have an urgency about how we pr- approach the time between now and eternity. Um, there was a day it, in the 20th century, really from about the 1940s into the late 70s, when we reached more people for the gospel than at any probably period of time in the history of the church. And there was a reason for that. You know what the reason was? We were driven by something. We had this urgency. Do you know what the urgency was? It was eschatology. You say, what is eschatology? We were driven by eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the last days. Here's what I mean by that. We were driven by the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is going to return. And because he's going to return, and because we don't know about the time, precise time, we know we only have a window of time left to do the work of God, right? Are y'all with me? So if we only have a window left, we ought to be living with urgency. And what drove us was we got to, we got to, we got to tell as many people as possible. We got to help as many people get in the kingdom of God while there's still time, while the window is still there. And so we were driven by that. But somewhere in the uh, early 80s, we began to shift our paradigm and we quit thinking about the fact that Jesus was going to return and we quit being inspired uh, to urgency and to live urgently because of the return of Christ. And we went to a more of let's make everybody feel good about God. 
And I want people to feel good about God, but I want people to also understand that if you don't know Jesus, it doesn't matter how good God is, you're you're not going to be there. And so we were driven by that. But we began to lose that in the 80s, and we began to move this kind of, are you happy for God, or God wants everybody to be happy with Him, and which, by the way, isn't the fact, isn't a fact at all. And so we kind of moved to that, and we lost the urgency. Well, Peter was calling them and reminding them to live with a kind of urgency because Christ is going to return. And I got to thinking as I was studying for this message, I thought, how would I... How, how would I classify? Because he says waiting. Did y'all notice that? Look there. Waiting and hastening. Isn't that a contradiction of terms? I thought, what is he talking about? And here's, here, here's what I've jotted down. He's talking uh, about a patient urgency. <laughs> a patient urgency. Now, what does that mean? Well, let, let's talk about, first of all, about being patient. We must be patient. If you go back over, look at verse 8. We didn't read this, and, but look at this. He says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. One day is a thousand years. So here's what he was saying to them. Live with urgency, but be patient, because God is working. You see, the critics were saying this to them. Uh, he's not coming back. If he were going to come back, he's had time to come back, and he hasn't come back, and so your faith is pointless. And so Peter says, no, be, be patient with what God has promised. God has promised something. God is going to fulfill that promise. And so one day is like a thousand years to us, to God. It's ir- time is irrelevant to him. Does that make sense? He's working his plan. And so he says to them, so don't wig out because God hasn't returned yet because God is up to his own agenda. So you wait patiently for him, but live with urgency. Why? Because he is coming back. You don't know the times and the seasons that are fixed, as the Scripture said. So be patient with the promise of God. God, where are you? Come on, God. God, what you? These people are doubting. These people. No, just God's at work. Be patient, but be urgent. You need to come to Christ. You know why you need to come to Christ? Because it's not going to be this way always. And we don't know when, when he's going to pull the plug on life support. Does that make sense to you? In other words, eternity, we must live patiently waiting on the Word of God to be fulfilled, but live with a kind of urgency knowing it will be fulfilled, and so eternity is never out of our minds. Have you ever heard this phrase? See if you can finish it for me. Out of sight. Yeah, most of you got that. Out of sight, out of mind. You've heard that before, right? And it's pretty true. It, it, things that we aren't looking at or thinking about kind of fade, right? We, we forget them. We forget about them, that kind of thing. Out of sight, out of mind. You know what Peter's saying? Uh, keep it in sight and in mind. Because Christ is going to return. Remember what he said. Don't listen to the scoffer. Don't listen to the critic. Don't listen to the culture that tells you, ah, oh, you, you, you know, you're just a fanatic or you're believing stuff. That, here we go again. Jesus is going to return. Yeah, yeah. We've been, we've been hearing that for 2,000 years. Jesus is going to, he's going to return. By the way, 2,000 years is nothing to him. It's like two days. Right? That's what he said. So what he wants us to get is we, we wait on the Word of God to be fulfilled. We don't, we're not discouraged by that. But because we're not keeping the clock or the calendar, we have this intensity in the way we, we conduct ourselves. <clears throat> Several years, 2014 actually, April 2014, there's a Swedish guy who's 37 years old, and he invented a new kind of wristwatch. It's called Ticker. T-I-K-K-E-R, ticker. And uh, it's a really different... I I went online to see if they're still available and everything. They're not right now. You can't get this watch right now because according to the website, uh, the chip shortage has made it difficult for them to produce this particular kind of wristwatch. But this is... (laughs) 
you're going to be excited about this wristwatch. This is really true. This guy, uh, by the way, you know what his, well, the watch is a countdown watch for your life. And he's used the same um, algorithm that the government uses to, which that tells you how trustworthy that ought to be, uh, uses to determine life expectancy. Did I say that? Yeah. Um, and so whatever algorithm they apply to life expectancy, and so I don't know how they calculate it, but you get this watch and, and then it uses that, and it, uh, it, it'll show uh, uh, years, uh, months, days, hours, and seconds that are estimated for how much life you have left, and the seconds disappear down this black hole. <laughs> And, oh, yeah, by the way, you know what this guy did before he invented this watch? I promise this is true. He's a grave digger. <laughs> and by the way, he said that this watch, this watch, he calls it an encouragement watch. Oh, look, <laughs> I only got that much time left. I'm fading away. Or, or I can see me saying to my grandson, hey, guys, look. I'm only going to be here this much longer. How encouraging is that, right? I mean, I, think, I don't think that's an encouragement. Any of you interested in wearing a watch like that? I think he probably he said we can't get short uh, chips. I don't think that's the real issue. Nobody wants that watch. What you doing? I'm looking. I'm dying. <laughs> they, uh, I'm dying. Got my death watch on. Uh, I think that's really the issue, don't you? That, that, that people like you want to buy that watch? Uh, no, but he calls it encouragement watch because here's what his motive. He said in creating that watch was it was to cause people to look at the brevity of their life and then make the most use of the time they have left. I don't know about you, but but I don't think my mind could do that. I think my mind, <laughs> I just lost. Did you see all that time I just lost? I'm, I just think that's how I would operate. Um, the fact is, though, that we do only have a, a window, don't we? And, and it's certainly true um, that, that, that life passes quickly. I, I, you know, I remember when I was a teenager... An uh, early teenager, I remember it seemed like it took forever till I got 16 and could drive. I mean, that seemed like the longest period of, of history, the history of the world, right? And so I finally got there, and now I got grandkids. I got to drive, and then I got grandkids. I mean, that's how it feels, <laughs> you know? Time really is brief, isn't it? And the fact that it's brief, and one of the things Peter wants us to give uh, to understand is that, that because it's brief, we need to live a certain way. And one of the things we do not need to do is live presumptively. That is that we don't assume that we have all the time in the world. There are people watching this broadcast, maybe people in this audience today, and you know what? You need to do some business with God. And you need to do it now. But there's something in our brains that argues, well, I got time. I'll do it later. I'll be, it'll be all right. I want to tell you something. You don't know how much time you have. You say, well, he's talking about the return of Christ. Yeah, that's right. There may be a long time before Christ returns, but you may meet him tomorrow, today, tonight. And see, see so there's, there should be an urgency about how we live because we can't presume that we've got all the time in the world. And there are people, again, watching, listening in this audience that maybe are saying, well, I'll eventually get my life together. Do you know what the Bible says? Behold, today is the day of salvation. Right now. And if you don't know him, man, at the end, when I give an invitation, why don't you put your trust in Jesus Christ? You don't even have to wait to the invitation. You can call on him now. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But not only should we not live presumptively, but we need to live in the will of God between here and eternity. Now, I think it was a couple of series ago that I, I told you, I, I gave you something, a line kind of, that I hope would stick in your mind. And I know it did for some people. I had a man that recently um, um, 
I, I visited with about some things that God's doing in his life. And he said, you said something coming. And you remember, and that kind of blew me away. Uh, and, and hopefully you did too. But a couple of series ago, I said this. The most important thing in the universe is, does anybody remember? Thanks, Chuck. Uh, anybody else that's not on staff? Yeah, yeah, y'all remember. I know I heard several. I'm teasing you. The, the, the most important thing in the universe is, say it with me, class, the will of God. That's the most important thing in the universe. Do you understand that? Look, it is the most important, and it is going to be accomplished. The will of God's going to be accomplished. It, whether you're in on it or not, the most important thing is the will of God. Do you remember the second thing I said? The most important thing in your life is doing the will of God. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If the most important thing in the universe is the will of God, then you and I doing the will of God, that's the most important thing uh, in our life. So between here and eternity, we must be people of holy character, and then we must be people of hastening conduct who are living with urgency, patiently waiting on the word of God to be fulfilled. But here's the last thing. We must then be people of high commitment. Look at verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting. High commitment. Remember, remember verses 3 and 4, if you want to go look at them at some other time. The critics were scoffing at the church. The critics were scoffing at the believers. It was a dark time. And they were waiting on the return of Christ. But their waiting was demonst a demonstration of a, their high commitment to the promise and the word of God that had been delivered to him. So I told you I'd come to this, and this is what I want to close with. I want you to get this. Their high commitment level was based on what God had said, the promise that God had given them. They were holding on to that promise. It kept them committed to the things of God and the things of eternity between here and there because they trusted in what God had said. God had done. So he says then, but according to his promise or his word, we are waiting. So we're waiting. So we are encouraged. We are encouraged because we know what he said. We're waiting on that. And that's true of us. Like them, we, we must hold fast to the promises of God's word between here and eternity. Because that will give us a sustaining kind of commitment to God. Especially, especially as the darkness gets darker, and especially as it closes in. The Bible teaches this, that, that in, in the latter days of history, that many will turn away from the truth of God. They'll doubt what God has said. And it was happening there. This is what the world was doing. So you really believe that? You really believe that stuff? You, you really, they were scoffing at them. So Peter says, look, we are... According to his word, we're holding on to that promise. The Bible says many will turn away. They'll give up the promises of God. They'll give up the truth of God. They'll give up the word of God. They may be even involved in things of God. They may be uh, religiously oriented, but they won't hang on. They won't hold on to the truth of God. Kind of like the kamikaze pilot. Y'all know what a kamikaze pilot was? Y'all how many of you know what a kamikaze pilot it was? Well, the, the last day, there'd be a lot of Christians that are like kamikaze pilots. I, I read about one who flew 50 missions. Thank you. 50 missions. He was involved, but he wasn't committed. And in and, and the, and the final days, there'd be, there'd be believers, the Bible says, that they're involved in religious things, they're involved, but they're not committed. So what is high commitment? What does it involve? Let me give, write these five things. Now, let me give you five things, and, I'm, and, and, and we're, we're finished. What does it involve? High commitment. Number one, high commitment involves holding fast to God's promises in the darkness. Holding fast to God's promises. This is high commitment. This is what the kind of people we are to be. People that hold to the promises of God in the darkness. You know, in those times when you can't see a way forward. It means that you trust God even when you cannot see God working. He's working. I just don't see Him working. It's dark. And I don't see how things are going to work out. 
but I have the promise of God. That's where they were. Hold on to the promises of God in the darkness. Number two, high commitment means holding fast to God's promises. Not only when it's dark, but when God seems silent. You've had those times before, haven't you? Where it just seems like God wasn't saying anything. God, by the way, I have a message I preached years ago. To what is God saying when he's silent? God is speaking even in the silence. We just don't always hear, and we may not always get a, a word as quickly as we wish, but here's what holding fast to the promises of God when it's silent means. It means that you trust God even though you don't hear His message or His word to you. You sometimes, you ever do this? You ever read the Scripture and you go, man, I don't think I got anything out of that. If you're honest, you, you read that, so man, that's just, ooh, the, you know, I, God, it's just like... I, I, I didn't get anything. You didn't hear anything. Listen, you got more than you think. And time will prove that. It's like taking medicine. You don't get up in the morning and take some medicine. If you take medicine, I do. I don't get up and say, man, whew, I'm craving that cholesterol medication. <laughs> you know, I don't get up doing that. And I don't take it and then go, ooh, I feel the plaque breaking up. You know, you don't, you don't do that. How do I know it's working? Because I go to my doctor and he does lab work and he says, man, it's working. It's working. By the way, I've tested it too. I decided I was doing pretty good one time, so I took a little break. W went to my doctor a couple months later and he said, whoa. He said, we got to up your medicine. And I said, why is that? He said, it ain't working anymore. I said, well, I, I need to come clean. I ain't been taking it. <laughs> he said, start taking it. It works. Listen, sometimes you're going to think that about the Word of God. You're going to say, well, I just don't think I'm getting much out of it. Please stay with it. It works. All right? Hold on to the promises of God, even when God seems silent. Number three, high commitment means holding fast to God's promises when your faith is tested. You know, when you're weary... When you're fatigued physically, spiritually, emotionally, you know those times when you want to quit? Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for we shall reap in due season if we do not give up. You know those times when your faith is tested? Do you know all of God's saints are tested? Did you know that? Do you know the Bible says Abraham? You know who Abraham was. He's a little minor figure in the Bible. The father of the faithful. You remember God said, I'm going to give you a son. You remember that story. God gave him a son. And then God said, now go, I want you to go offer him on the altar as a sacrifice. This is the son of the promise that God had given to Abraham. Do you know what it says before you start reading that story? It says, then God tested Abraham. All God's people get tested. Now there are things we face in a broken world. But we also have these tests that come from God. High commitment means that you hold fast to the promises of God when your faith is tested, when you want to throw in the towel, when you're weary. There's some of you watching. There's some of you in here today, and you say, Pastor, I'm kind of there. Man, I don't know if I can take anymore. I don't know if I can face any anymore. And you're being tested. Your faith is being tested, and you want to quit. Don't. High commitment says, I hold on to the promises, the Word of God, when my faith is being stretched and tested. Number four, holding, high commitment is holding fast to the promises or the Word of God when you are undergoing severe spiritual warfare. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, the warfare is going to get more intense as the age gets further from God. It's going to get more intense. It's going to take greater courage. And, and uh, listen, so what I do when I'm facing severe spiritual warfare, you know what I do? I remind myself. I hold the promises of God. What does God say? I will never leave you or forsake you. Yes, God, I need that. I'm in spiritual war. What does God say? Uh, 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 greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Oh, yeah, God, I needed that. Uh, oh, what does God say? What's the promise God gives me when I'm facing spiritual warfare? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah, Lord, thank you. I needed that. I'm in spiritual warfare. How do I hang on? Oh, I, I, I remember that nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. 
You with me? I hold on to the promises. I remember the promises. Here's the promises. I remember I need the armor of God. I, I cling to these things. You know, when you feel like the odds are against you and that victory is nowhere in sight. And then number five, high commitment means holding fast to God's promises when you are discouraged and depressed. Anybody here ever get discouraged? Well, if you don't, go get you a ticker watch. <laughs> I, I, I mean, do you ever get discouraged? you ever battle depression? Hold on to the promises of God. David did it. Psalm 42, we seem holding on to the truth of God. You're discouraged. You're depressed. You're despairing. And you wonder if you'll ever experience the joy of life and God again. That You wonder if your soul will ever be refreshed again. Hold on. Hold on to the promises. Hold on to the Word of God when you are discouraged and depressed. You're in a race. You're in a race. Stay in the race. Stay in your lane. Don't worry about somebody else's lane. You just stay in your lane. Japanese marathon runner Shizu Kanakuri competed in the qualifying trials for the 1912 Stockholm Olympics. And he was a good runner. And Kanakuri set a marathon world record in 1912. And he was selected as one of the only two athletes that Japan could afford to send to the Olympics that year. However, Kanakuri, while racing in the 1912 Olympic marathon, suddenly disappeared in the middle of the race. <clears throat> well, you need to know, the, before he got there, he had an eight day, it was an 18-day journey from Japan to Stockholm, Sweden. And first, several days was uh, by a ship. It beat him up in the ocean. And then after that, he, he, was, he, he boarded a train that took him through the Trans-Siberian Railway. He needed, just fi he needed five days just to recover from the train trip itself before he could run the race. And Kanakuri, weakened by all the travails of trying to get to Sweden to run the race, uh, he lost consciousness in the middle of the race. He just collapsed from his weariness and fatigue. And a family took him in and they cared for him until he recovered enough. But he was so embarrassed by his failure that he returned to Japan without notifying the race officials of what had happened. Swedish authorities considered, listen to this, they considered Kanakuri missing because they never knew what happened. He just kind of vanished out of the race. They considered him missing for 50 years before they discovered that he was alive in Japan in 1967. And when they found that he was actually alive, they offered him the opportunity to come back and complete his run. And he accepted the offer, and he came back, and he completed his marathon in 54 years, Eight months, six days, five hours, 32 minutes, and 20.3 seconds. And when he was finished with it, they interviewed him. And speaking about it, he says, well, it was a long trip. Along the way, I got married, had six children, and ten grandchildren. We know the Bible is full of stories of people who quit. They lost their commitment but later, with God's help, they recommitted and finished their race. You know, Moses, Moses, before he took the children out of, out of Egypt, he spent 40 years in the desert before God called him anew, before he recommitted to the purpose of God. Peter denied Christ. You know what he did? He went back to fishing. Peter went back to me after he denied Christ until Jesus showed up on the shores and said, Peter, I'm not finished with you. And he recommitted, well, we know the rest of that story. And there are others like John Mark who, who started out as a missionary with Paul and, and, and dropped out. But later he would be 
recommissioned and he would go with Barnabas and later again be reunited with Paul in their efforts, a recommitment. And there are so many others, like Samson, who, who finished well. He recommitted himself to, to God and he finished well. Many others who eventually finished the race. And that's what we're in. The Bible says we're in like this race between here and eternity. That's why Paul said, in, or, or uh, Hebrews says in chapter 12, verse 1, seeing that we're encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that is marked out before us with endurance, keeping our eyes fixed upon the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus. How do you run? How do you make it? How do you live between here and eternity? You put your eyes on Jesus. Every day you run the race. High commitment. High commitment because of the promises of God, because of the Word of God to you. You stay in it. You stay in it. There are some of you today, you feel like quitting. Stay in the race. Keep running the race. Put your eyes on Jesus. Stop listening to all the voices around you. We just came back from New Orleans, as I said. And uh, so we're driving back. Alice and I are driving back. And uh, it comes lunchtime. And I've got, uh, I've got my GPS on. You know, it's talking to me uh, for the fastest route and all that kind of stuff. It's telling me, you know how it does. And, you know, you freak these things out if you turn off the highway and go through. They start, you know, make a U turn, make quick, make, make a U turn at the next light. And if you go through that light, it says, up, oh, up, oh, make a U turn. You know, that's sort of, I, I envision the little machine in there going, <laughs> don't you? I mean, the panic, like, this, he's not following the instructions. But I've got it on, and Allison says, we're, we're, we're running down the highway, and she wants Chick-fil-A for lunch, a late lunch, as it turns out. And she, she said, I said, well, just put it in your, your phone, and it'll tell us where, where it is, okay? And so she does. She puts it in her phone, and it start, her phone starts talking to us. Her phone is trying to get us to Chick-fil-A. My phone's trying to get us home. So we have competing GPSs going on in the car. And so to get to Chick-fil-A, we have to go this way. And then mine starts going, wrong way. Turn around at the next light. And hers is going at the same time, at the next light, go uh, right. And mine's saying, at the next light, make a U-turn. And all of this kind of stuff. And we're laughing because you've got these competing voices. And I thought, isn't that just like the world we're living in? One voice saying, go this way. Another voice saying, go this way. Pulling both, both. And I have to tell you something. It messes with your mind when you hear two different GPSs going. I'm, it's a weird, have you ever done that? It's a weird thing. That's just like the world. The world is out there and there are all these voices. Listen, you want to live between here and eternity? Put your eyes on one person and tune your ears into God's word. So that all the competing voices around you don't pull you in a direction you don't need to go in. That's how you live between here and eternity. These, kind of, these are the kind of people we need to be. Would you bow your head, close your eyes? Nobody's looking around in this place. And maybe, maybe this morning you've never put your trust in Christ. You see, it starts there. And I want to give you the opportunity to do that. You can do that if you're watching online in this live audience, wherever it may be, you can call on him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right now, you can call out to him, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I know I'm a sinner, and I know that I need you, and I don't need religion. I need you. And so I invite you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. Help me then to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit. Live every day, Father, between here and eternity. In your will, help me to walk. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm one of those that's felt like quitting, giving up, throwing in the towel. And I want to urge you to right now tell the Lord, Lord, I recommit. I'm going to cling to the promises. I'm going to cling to your word. When I don't hear you, when I don't see you, when my faith is being tested, in the darkness, in the light, wherever it is, I'm going to trust in you and in your word. I recommit myself, just like Peter, Moses, 
just like those who've come before me. I put my eyes on Christ. Father, would you hear these prayers? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation? Uh, staff are going to be on the aisles like I am. I want to invite you to slip out balcony in this ground floor. And if there's a decision, if you prayed that prayer, would you come to one of us and just tell us about that? You can use the tear-off panel to record your, your decision. You can take that by the Welcome Center, drop it in the basket, all of that kind of stuff. But I want to invite you to slip out from where you're seated. Come to one of us and say, this is the decision I've made. You may be here this morning and you may say, you know what I need? I need a church home or family. We'd love to have you at Ridgecrest. Why don't you slip out, come to one of us saying, we'll take it from there, don't you worry about it. Every week people do it, every week people join, every week people trust Christ. It's a wonderful thing what God is doing in our, our church. But maybe today is the day for you. You may want to come and pray around this altar. It's open, use it. You know, the, you know the biblical worship posture, you know what it is? It's a bent knee. Maybe you want to just come and you want to talk to him. You're praying about something, maybe some, something going on in your life. Maybe it's a decision you've got to make. Maybe it's a decision somebody else has to make. Maybe you're praying for somebody. Whatever it is, come bend a knee before the Lord. Use this altar to worship by bringing your need, your prayers, your requests to him. Come and lay them there. Are you ready? As Bradley leads us, balcony ground floor, you slip out right now. You come on.